This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Recorded by Susan Denny. Chapter 13 A Sneeze Out of Season. I had occasion to smile, nay, to laugh at Madame again, within the space of four-and-twenty hours, after the little scene treated of in the last chapter. Villette owns a climate as variable, though not so humid, as that of any English town. A night of high wind followed upon that soft sunset, and all the next day was one of dry storm, dark, beclouded, yet rainless. The streets were dim with sand and dust whirled from the boulevards. I know not that even lovely weather would have tempted me to spend the evening time of study and recreation where I had spent it yesterday. My alley, and, indeed, all the walks and shrubs in the garden, had acquired a new but not a pleasant interest. Their seclusion was now become precarious, their calm insecure. That casement which reigned B.A., had vulgarized the once dear nook it overlooked, and elsewhere the eyes of the flowers had gained vision, and the knots in the tree boles listened like secret ears. Some plants there were, indeed, trodden down by Dr. John in his search, and his hasty and heedless progress, which I wished to prop up, water, and revive. Some footmarks, too, he had left on the beds, but these, in spite of the strong wind, I found a moment's leisure to efface very early in the morning, ere common eyes had discovered them. With a pensive sort of content, I sat down to my desk and my German, while the pupils settled to their evening lessons, and the other teachers took up their needlework. The scene of the étude du soir was always the refectory, a much smaller apartment than any of the three classes or schoolrooms for here none, save the boarders, were ever admitted, and these numbered only a score. Two lamps hung from the ceiling over the two tables. These were lit at dusk, and their kindling was the signal for school-books being set aside, a grave demeanor assumed, general silence enforced, and then commenced la lecture pieuse. This said, lecture pieuse, was, I soon found, mainly designed as a wholesome mortification of the intellect, a useful humiliation of the reason, and such a dose for common sense as she might digest at her leisure, and thrive on as she best could. The book brought out, it was never changed, but when finished, recommenced, was a venerable volume, old as the hills, gray as the Hôtel de Ville. I would have given two francs for the chance of getting that book once into my hands, turning over the sacred yellow leaves, ascertaining the title, and perusing with my own eyes the enormous figments which, as an unworthy heretic, it was only permitted me to drink in with my bewildered ears. This book contained legends of the saints. Good God! I speak the words reverently. What legends they were! what gasconading rascals those saints must have been if they first boasted these exploits or invented these miracles these legends however were no more than monkish extravagances over which one laughed inwardly there were besides priestly matters and the priestcraft of the book was far worse than its monkery the ears burned on each side of my head as I listened, perforce, to tales of moral martyrdom inflicted by Rome, the dread boasts of confessors who had wickedly abused their office, trampling to deep degradation high-born ladies, making of countesses and princesses the most tormented slaves under the sun. Stories like that of Conrad and Elizabeth of Hungary recurred again and again, with all its dreadful viciousness, sickening tyranny, and black impiety, tales that were nightmares of oppression, privation, and agony. I sat out this lecture pieuse for some nights as well as I could, and as quietly, too, 
only once breaking off the points of my scissors by involuntarily sticking them somewhat deep in the worm-eaten board of the table before me. But at last it made me so burning hot, and my temples and my heart and my wrist throbbed so fast, and my sleep afterwards was so broken with excitement that I could sit no longer. Prudence recommended henceforward a swift clearance of my person from the place, the moment that guilty old book was brought out. No Ma's Hedrick ever felt a stronger call to take up her testimony against Sergeant Bothwell than I, to speak my mind in this matter of the popish lecture pieuse. However, I did manage somehow to curb and rein in, and though always, as soon as Rosine came to light the lamps, I shot from the room quickly, yet also I did it quietly, seizing that vantage moment given by the little bustle before the dead silence, and vanishing whilst the boarders put their books away. When I vanished, it was into darkness. Candles were not allowed to be carried about, and the teacher who forsook the refectory had only the unlit hall, schoolroom, or bedroom as a refuge. In winter I sought the long classes, and paced them fast to keep myself warm, fortunate if the moon shone, and if there were only stars soon reconciled to their dim gleam, or even to the total eclipse of their absence. In summer it was never quite dark, and then I went upstairs to my own quarter of the long dormitory, opened my own casement. That chamber was lit by five casements, large as great doors, and leaning out, looked forth upon the city beyond the garden, and listened to band music from the park or the palace square, thinking meantime my own thoughts, living my own life, in my own still shadow world. This evening, fugitive as usual before the Pope and his works, I mounted the staircase, approached the dormitory, and quietly opened the door, which was always kept carefully shut, and which, like every other door in this house, revolved noiselessly on well-oiled hinges. Before I saw, I felt that life was in the great room, usually void, not that there was either stir or breath or rustle of sound, but vacuum lacked, solitude was not at home. All the white beds, the lit d'ange, as they were poetically termed, lay visible at a glance. All were empty. No sleeper reposed therein. The sound of a drawer cautiously slid out struck my ear. Stepping a little to one side, my vision took a free range, unimpeded by falling curtains. I now commanded my own bed and my own toilet, with a locked work-box upon it, and locked drawers underneath. Very good. A dumpy, motherly little body, in decent shawl, and the cleanest of possible nightcaps, stood before this toilet, hard at work, apparently doing me the kindness of tidying out the meuble. Open stood the lid of the work-box, open the top drawer. Duly and impartially was each succeeding drawer opened in turn. Not an article of their contents but was lifted and unfolded, not a paper but was glanced over, not a little box but was unlidded, and beautiful was the adroitness, exemplary the care, with which the search was accomplished. Madame wrought at it like a true star, unhasting yet unresting. I will not deny that it was with a secret glee I watched her. Had I been a gentleman, I believe Madame would have found favor in my eyes. She was so handy, neat, thorough in all she did. Some people's movements provoke the soul by their loose awkwardness. Hers, satisfied by their trim compactness. I stood, in short, fascinated. But it was necessary to make an effort to break this spell. A retreat must be beaten. The searcher might have turned and caught me. There would have been nothing for it then but a scene, and she and I would have had to come all at once, with a sudden clash, to a thorough knowledge of each other. Down would have gone conventionalities, away swept disguises, and I should have looked into her eyes and she into mine. We should have known that we could work together no more, and parted in this life for ever. Where was the use of tempting such a catastrophe? I was not angry and had no wish in the world to leave her. 
I could hardly get another employer whose yoke would be so light, and so easy of carriage. And truly I liked Madame for her capital sense, whatever I might think of her principles. As to her system, it did me no harm. She might work me with it to her heart's content. Nothing would come of the operation. Loverless and inexpectant of love, I was as safe from spies in my heart poverty as the beggar from thieves in his destitution of purse. I turned then and fled, descending the stairs with progress as swift and soundless as that of the spider, which at the same instant ran down the banister. How I laughed when I reached the schoolroom! I knew now she had certainly seen Dr. John in the garden. I knew what her thoughts were. The spectacle of a suspicious nature so far misled by its own inventions tickled me much. Yet as the laugh died, a kind of wrath smote me, and then bitterness followed. It was the rock struck, and Meribah's waters gushing out. I never had felt so strange and contradictory an inward tumult as I felt for an hour that evening. Soreness and laughter, and fire and grief, shared my heart between them. I cried hot tears, not because Madame mistrusted me. I did not care tuppence for her mistrust, but for other reasons. Complicated, disquieting thoughts broke up the whole repose of my nature. However, that turmoil subsided. Next day I was again Lucy Snow. On revisiting my drawers I found them all securely locked. The closest subsequent examination could not discover change or apparent disturbance in the position of one object. My few dresses were folded as I had left them. A certain little bunch of white violets that had once been silently presented to me by a stranger, a stranger to me, for we had never exchanged words, and which I had dried and kept for its sweet perfume between the folds of my best dress, lay there unstirred. My black silk scarf, my lace chemisette and collars, were unrumpled. Had she creased one solitary article, I own I should have felt much greater difficulty in forgiving her. But finding all straight and orderly, I said, Let bygones be bygones. I am unharmed. Why should I bear malice? A thing there was which puzzled myself, and I sought in my brain a key to that riddle almost as sedulously as Madame had sought a guide to useful knowledge in my toilet drawers. How was it that Dr. John, if he had not been accessory to the dropping of that casket into the garden, should have known that it was dropped, and appeared so promptly on the spot to seek it? So strong was the wish to clear up this point that I began to entertain this daring suggestion. Why may I not, in case I should ever have the opportunity, ask Dr. John himself to explain this coincidence? and so long as dr john was absent i really believed i had courage to test him with such a question little georgette was now convalescent and her physician accordingly made his visits very rare indeed he would have ceased them altogether had not madame insisted on his giving an occasional call till the child should be quite well she came into the nursery one evening just after i had listened to georgette's lisped and broken prayer and had put her to bed. Taking the little one's hand, she said, Cet enfant a toujours un peu de fièvre. And presently afterwards, looking at me with a quicker glance than was habitual to her quiet eye, Le docteur Jean, l'a-t-il vu dernièrement? Non, n'est-ce pas? Of course, she knew this better than any other person in the house. Well, she continued, I am going out, pour faire quelques courses en fiacre. I shall call on Dr. John and send him to the child. I will that he sees her this evening. Her cheeks are flushed. Her pulse is quick. You will receive him for my part. I shall be from home. Now the child was well enough, only warm with the warmth of July. It was scarcely less needful to send for a priest to administer extreme unction than for a doctor to prescribe a dose. Also, Madame rarely made course, as she called them, in the evening. Moreover, this was the first time she had chosen to absent herself on the occasion of a visit from Dr. John. The whole arrangement indicated some plan. This I saw, but without the least anxiety. Ha, ha, madame, laughed light heart the beggar. 
Your crafty wits are on the wrong tack. She departed, attired very smartly, in a shawl of price and a certain chapeau vert tendre, hazardous, as to its tint for any complexion less fresh than her own, but to her not unbecoming. I wondered what she intended, whether she really would send Dr. John or not, or whether indeed he would come, he might be engaged. Madame had charged me not to let Georgette sleep till the doctor came. I had therefore sufficient occupation in telling her nursery tales, and palavering the little language for her benefit. I affected Georgette. She was a sensitive and a loving child. To hold her in my lap, or carry her in my arms, was to me a treat. Tonight she would have me lay my head on the pillow of her crib. She even put her little arms round my neck. Her clasp and the nestling action with which she pressed her cheek to mine made me almost cry with a tender pain. Feeling of no kind abounded in that house. This pure little drop from a pure little source was too sweet. It penetrated deep and subdued the heart and sent a gush to the eyes. Half an hour or an hour passed. Georgette murmured in her soft lisp that she was growing sleepy. And you shall sleep, thought I, Malgré maman et médecin, if they are not here in ten minutes. Hark! There was a ring, and there the tread, astonishing the staircase by the fleetness with which it left the steps behind. Rosine introduced Dr. John, and with a freedom of manner not altogether peculiar to herself, but characteristic of the domestics of Villette generally, she stayed to hear what he had to say. Madame's presence would have awed her back to her own realm of the vestibule and the cabinet. For mine, or that of any other teacher or pupil, she cared not a jot. Smart, trim, and pert, she stood, a hand in each pocket of her grey grisette apron, eyeing Dr. John with no more fear or shyness than if he had been a picture instead of a living gentleman. Le marmot n'a rien, n'est-ce pas? said she, indicating Georgette with a jerk of her chin. Pas beaucoup, was the answer, as the doctor hastily scribbled with his pencil some harmless prescription. Eh bien, pursued Rosine, approaching him quite near, while he put up his pencil. And the box, did you get it? Monsieur went off like a coup de vent the other night. I had not time to ask him. I found it, yes. And who threw it, then, continued Rosine, speaking quite freely the very words I should so much have wished to say, but had no address or courage to bring it out. How short some people make the road to a point which, for others, seems unattainable. That may be my secret, rejoined Dr. John briefly, but with no sort of hauteur. He seemed quite to understand the Rosine or Grisette character. Mais enfin, continued she, nothing abashed, Monsieur knew it was thrown. Since he came to seek it, how did he know? I was attending a little patient in the college near, said he, and saw it dropped out of his chamber window, and so came to pick it up. How simple the whole explanation! The note had alluded to a physician as then examining Gustave. Ah, ça! pursued Rosine. Il n'y a donc rien là-dessous. Pas de mystère. Pas de Mourette, par exemple. Pas plus que sur ma main, responded the doctor, showing his palm. Quel dommage, responded the grisette. Et moi, à qui tout cela commençait à donner des idées. Vraiment, vous en êtes pour vos frais, was the doctor's cool rejoinder. She pouted. The doctor could not help laughing at the sort of moue she made. When he laughed, he had something peculiarly good-natured and genial in his look. I saw his hand inclined to his pocket. "'How many times have you opened the door for me within this last month?' he asked. "'Monsieur ought to have kept count of that,' said Rosine quite readily. "'As if I had not something better to do,' rejoined he. But I saw him give her a piece of gold, which she took unscrupulously, and then danced off to answer the doorbell ringing just now every five minutes, as the various servants came to fetch the half-boarders. The reader must not think too hardly of Rosine. On the whole, she was not a bad sort of person, 
and had no idea there could be any disgrace in grasping at whatever she could get, or any effrontery in chattering like a pea to the best gentleman in Christendom. I had learnt something from the above scene besides what concerned the ivory box, viz., that not on the robe de jaconat, pink or grey, nor yet on the frilled and pocketed apron, lay the blame of breaking Dr. John's heart. These items of array were obviously guiltless as Georgette's little blue tunic. So much the better. But who then was the culprit? What was the ground? What the origin? What the perfect explanation of the whole business? Some points had been cleared, but how many yet remained obscure as night? However, I said to myself, it is no affair of yours, and turning from the face on which I had been unconsciously dwelling with a questioning gaze, I looked through the window which commanded the garden below. Dr. John, meantime, standing by the bedside, was slowly drawing on his gloves and watching his little patient as her eyes closed and her rosy lips parted in coming sleep. I waited till he should depart as usual with a quick bow and scarce articulate good night. Just as he took his hat, my eyes, fixed on the tall houses bounding the garden, saw the one lattice, already commemorated, cautiously open. Fourth, from the aperture projected a hand and a white handkerchief, both waved. I know not whether the signal was answered from some viewless quarter of our own dwelling, but immediately after there fluttered from the lattice a falling object, white and light, Billet the second, of course. There! I ejaculated involuntarily. Where? asked Dr. John with energy, making direct for the window. What is it? They have gone and done it again, was my reply. A handkerchief waved, and something fell. And I pointed to the lattice, now closed and looking hypocritically blank. Go at once, pick it up, and bring it here, was his prompt direction, adding, Nobody will take notice of you. I should be seen. Straight I went. After some little search I found a folded paper, lodged on the lower branch of a shrub. I seized and brought it direct to Dr. John. This time I believe not even Rosine saw me. He instantly tore the billet into small pieces, without reading it. It is not in the least her fault, you must remember, he said, looking at me. Whose fault, I asked. Who is it? You don't yet know, then? Not in the least. Have you no guess? None. If I knew you better, I might be tempted to risk some confidence, and thus secure you as guardian over a most innocent and excellent, but somewhat inexperienced being. As a duenna? I asked. Yes, said he abstractedly. What snares are round her, he added musingly, and now certainly for the first time he examined my face, anxious, doubtless to see if any kindly expression there would warrant him in recommending to my care and indulgence some ethereal creature against whom powers of darkness were plotting. I felt no particular vocation to undertake the surveillance of ethereal creatures, but recalling the scene at the bureau, it seemed to me that I owed him a good turn, if I could help him, then I would. And it lay not with me to decide how. With as little reluctance as might be, I intimated that I was willing to do what I could towards taking care of any person in whom he might be interested. I am no farther interested than as a spectator, said he, with modesty, admirable as I thought to witness. I happen to be acquainted with the rather worthless character of the person who, from the house opposite, has now twice invaded the sanctity of this place. I have also met in society the object at whom these vulgar attempts are aimed. Her exquisite superiority and innate refinement ought, one would think, to scare impertinence from her very idea. It is not so, however. An innocent, unsuspicious as she is, I would guard her from evil if I could. In person, however, I can do nothing. I cannot come near her. He paused. Well, I am willing to help you, said I. Only tell me how. And busily, in my own mind, 
I ran over the list of our inmates, seeking this paragon, this pearl of great price, this gem without flaw. It must be madame, I concluded. She only, amongst us all, has the art even to seem superior. But as to being unsuspicious, inexperienced, etc., Dr. John need not distract himself about that. However, this is just his whim, and I will not contradict him. He shall be humored. His angel shall be an angel. Just notify the quarter to which my care is to be directed, I continued gravely, chuckling, however, to myself, over the thought of being set to chaperone Madame Beck or any of her pupils. Now Dr. John had a fine set of nerves, and he at once felt by instinct what no more coarsely constituted mind would have detected, namely, that I was a little amused at him. The color rose to his cheek. With half a smile he turned and took his hat. He was going. My heart smote me. "'I will. I will help you,' said I eagerly. "'I will do what you wish. I will watch over your angel. I will take care of her. Only tell me who she is.' "'But you must know.' said he then with earnestness, yet speaking very low, so spotless, so good, so unspeakably beautiful, impossible that one house should contain two like her. I allude, of course, here the latch of Madame Beck's chamber door, opening into the nursery, gave a sudden click, as if the hand holding it had been slightly convulsed, there was the suppressed explosion of an irrepressible sneeze. These little accidents will happen to the best of us. Madame, excellent woman, was then on duty. She had come home quietly, stolen upstairs on tiptoe. She was in her chamber. If she had not sneezed, she would have heard all, and so should I. But that unlucky sternutation routed Dr. John. While he stood aghast, she came forward, alert, composed, in the best yet most tranquil spirits. No novice to her habits, but would have thought she had just come in, and scouted the idea of her ear having been glued to the keyhole for at least ten minutes. She affected to sneeze again, declared she was enrhumé, and then proceeded volubly to recount her course en fiacre. The prayer bell rang, and I left her with the doctor. End of chapter 13「LibriVox recording」All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Ophelia in New South Wales, Australia, September 2006. Villette by Charlotte Bronte. Chapter 14 The Fate. As soon as Georgette was well, Madame sent her away into the country. I was sorry. I loved the child, and her loss made me poorer than before. But I must not complain. I lived in a house full of robust life. I might have had companions, and I chose solitude. Each of the teachers in turn made me overtures of special intimacy. I tried them all. One I found to be an honest woman, but a narrow thinker, a coarse feeler, and an egotist. The second was a Parisienne, externally refined at heart corrupt, without a creed, without a principle, without an affection. Having penetrated the outward crust of decorum in this character, you found the sloth beneath. She had a wonderful passion for presents, and in this point the third teacher, a person otherwise characterless and insignificant, closely resembled her. This last named had also one other distinctive property, that of avarice. In her reigned the love of money for its own sake. The sight of a piece of gold would bring into her eyes a green glisten, singular to witness. 
She once, as a mark of high favour, took me upstairs, and, opening a secret door, showed me a hoard, a mass of coarse, large coin, about fifteen guineas, in five franc pieces. She loved this hoard as a bird loves its eggs. These were her savings. She would come and talk to me about them with an infatuated and persevering dotage, strange to behold in a person not yet twenty-five. The Parisienne, on the other hand, was prodigal and profligate, in disposition, that is, as to action I do not know. That latter quality showed its snake-like head to me but once, peeping out very cautiously. A curious kind of reptile it seemed, judging from the glimpse I got, its novelty whetted my curiosity. If it would have come out boldly, perhaps I might philosophically have stood my ground, and coolly surveyed the long thing from forked tongue to scaly tail-tip. But it merely rustled in the leaves of a bad novel, and, on encountering a hasty and ill-advised demonstration of wrath, recoiled and vanished, hissing. She hated me from that day. This Parisienne was always in debt, her salary being anticipated, not only in dress, but in perfumes, cosmetics, confectionery, and condiments. What a cold, callous epicure she was in all things! I see her now, thin in face and figure, sallow in complexion, regular in features, with perfect teeth, lips like a thread, a large, prominent chin, a well-opened but frozen eye, of light at once craving and ingrate. She mortally hated work, and loved what she called pleasure, being an insipid, heartless, brainless dissipation of time. Madame Beck knew this woman's character perfectly well. She once talked to me about her, with an odd mixture of discrimination, indifference, and antipathy. I asked why she kept her in the establishment. She answered plainly, because it suited her interest to do so, and pointed out a fact that I had already noticed, namely that Mademoiselle Saint-Pierre possessed, in an almost unique degree, the power of keeping order amongst her undisciplined ranks of scholars. A certain petrifying influence accompanied and surrounded her. Without passion, noise, or violence, she held them in check, as a breezeless frost air might still a brawling stream. She was of little use as far as communication of knowledge went, but for strict surveillance and maintenance of rules she was invaluable. "'Je sais bien qu'elle n'a pas de principe, ni peut-être de mœurs, admitted Madame frankly, but added with philosophy, "'Son maintien en classe est toujours convenable, et rempli même d'une certaine dignité. C'est tout ce qu'il faut. Ni les élèves, ni les parents ne regardent plus loin.' ni par conséquent, moi non plus. A strange, frolicsome, noisy little world was this school. Great pains were taken to hide chains with flowers. A subtle essence of Romanism pervaded every arrangement. Large, sensual indulgence, so to speak, was permitted by way of counterpoise to jealous spiritual restraint. Each mind was being reared in slavery. But to prevent reflection from dwelling on this fact, Every pretext for physical recreation was seized and made the most of. There, as elsewhere, the church strove to bring up her children robust in body, feeble in soul, fat, ruddy, hale, joyous, ignorant, unthinking, unquestioning. Eat, drink, and live, she says. Look after your bodies, leave your souls to me. I hold their cure, guide their course, I guarantee their final fate." a bargain in which every true Catholic deems himself a gainer. Lucifer just offers the same terms. All this power will I give thee, and the glory of it, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. About this time, in the ripest glow of summer, Madame Beck's house became as merry a place as a school could well be. All day long the broad folding doors and the two-leaved casements stood wide open. Settled sunshine seemed naturalised in the atmosphere. Clouds were far off, sailing away beyond the sea, resting, no doubt, round islands such as England, that dear land of mists, but withdrawn wholly from the drier continent. We lived far more in the garden than under a roof. Classes were held and meals partaken of in the Grand Berceau. Moreover, there was a note of holiday preparation, which almost turned freedom into licence. The autumnal long vacation was but two months distant, but before that a great day, an important ceremony, none other than the fate of Madame, awaited celebration. The conduct of this fate evolved chiefly on Mademoiselle St. Pierre, 
Madame herself being supposed to stand aloof, disinterestedly unconscious of what might be going forward in her honour. Especially she never knew, never in the least suspected, that a subscription was annually levied on the whole school for a purchase of a handsome present. The polite tact of the reader will please to leave out of the account a brief secret consultation on this point in Madame's own chamber. "'What will you have this year?' was asked by her Parisian lieutenant. "'Oh, no matter, let it alone. Let the poor children keep their francs.' And Madame looked benign and modest. The Saint-Pierre would here protrude her chin. She knew Madame by heart. She always called her airs of bonté des grimaces. She never even professed to respect them one instant. "'Vite!' she would say coldly. "'Name the article. Shall it be jewellery or porcelain, haberdashery or silver?' Eh bien, deux ou trois cuillers et autant de fourchettes en agent. And the result was a handsome case containing three hundred francs worth of plate. The programme of the fete day's proceedings comprised presentation of plate, collation in the garden, dramatic performance with pupils and teachers for actors, a dance and supper. Very gorgeous seemed the effect of the whole to me, as I well remember. Zélie Saint-Pierre understood these things and managed them ably. The play was the main point, a month's previous drilling being there required. The choice, too, of the actors required knowledge and care. Then came lessons in elocution, in attitude, and then the fatigue of countless rehearsals. For all this, as may well be supposed, Saint-Pierre did not suffice. Other management, other accomplishments than hers were requisite here. They were supplied in the person of a master, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, professor of literature. It was never my lot to be present at the histrionic lessons of Monsieur Paul, but I often saw him as he crossed the Carré, a square hall between the dwelling-house and the schoolhouse. I heard him, too, in the warm evenings, lecturing with open doors, and his name, with anecdotes of him, resounded in one's ears from all sides, especially our former acquaintance, Miss Ginevra Fanshaw, who had been selected to take a prominent part in the play, used, in bestowing upon me a large portion of her leisure, to lard her discourse with frequent allusions to his sayings and doings. She esteemed him hideously plain, and used to profess herself frightened almost into hysterics at the sound of his step or voice. A dark little man he certainly was, pungent and austere, even to me he seemed a harsh apparition, with his close-shorn black head, his broad, sallow brow, his thin cheek, his wide and quivering nostril, his thorough glance and hurried bearing. Irritable he was, one heard that as he apostrophized with vehemence the awkward squad under his orders. Sometimes he would break out on these raw amateur actresses with a passion of impatience at their falseness of conception, their coldness of emotion, their feebleness of delivery. Écoutez! he would cry, and then his voice rang through the premises like a trumpet. And when, mimicking it, came the small pipe of a Ginevra, a Mathilde, or a Blanche, one understood why a hollow groan of scorn, or a fierce hiss of rage, rewarded the tame echo. Vous n'êtes donc que des poupées! I heard him thunder. Vous n'avez pas de passion, vous autres! Vous ne sentez donc rien? Votre chair est de neige, votre sang de glace. Moi, je veux que tout cela s'allume, qu'il ait une vie, une âme. Vain resolve. And when he at last found it, it was vain. He suddenly broke the whole business down. Hitherto he had been teaching them a grand tragedy. He tore the tragedy in morsels and came next day with a compact little comic trifle. To this they took more kindly. He presently knocked it all into their smooth, round pates. Mademoiselle Saint-Pierre always presided at Monsieur Emmanuel's lessons, and I was told that the polish of her manner, her seeming attention, her tact and grace, impressed that gentleman very favourably. She had, indeed, the art of pleasing, for a given time, whom she would. But the feeling would not last. In an hour it was dried like dew, vanished like gossamer. The day preceding Madame's fate was as much a holiday as the fate itself. It was devoted to clearing out, cleaning, arranging, and decorating the three schoolrooms. All within doors was the gayest bustle. Neither upstairs nor down could a quiet, isolated person find rest for the sole of her foot. 
Accordingly, for my part, I took refuge in the garden. The whole day did I wander or sit there alone, finding warmth in the sun, shelter among the trees, and a sort of companionship in my own thoughts. I well remember that I exchanged but two sentences that day with any living being. Not that I felt solitary. I was glad to be quiet. For a looker-on it sufficed to pass through the rooms once or twice, observe what changes were being wrought, how a green room and a dressing room were being contrived, a little stage with scenery erected, how Monsieur Paul Emmanuel, in conjunction with Mademoiselle St. Pierre, was directing all, and how an eager band of pupils, among them Ginevra Fanshawe, were working gaily under his control. The great day arrived. The sun rose hot and unclouded, and hot and unclouded it burned on till evening. All the doors and all the windows were set open, which gave a pleasant sense of summer freedom, and freedom the most complete seemed indeed the order of the day. Teachers and pupils descended to breakfast in dressing gowns and curl papers, anticipating avec délice the toilette of the evening. They seemed to take a pleasure in indulging that forenoon in a luxury of slovenliness like aldermen fasting in preparation for a feast. About nine o'clock a.m. an important functionary, the coiffeur, arrived. Sacrilegious to state, he fixed his headquarters in the oratory, and there, in presence of bénitier, candle, and crucifix, solemnized the mysteries of his art. Each girl was summoned in turn to pass through his hands, emerging from them with head as smooth as a shell, intersected by faultless white lines, and wreathed about with Grecian plaits that shone as if lacquered. I took my turn with the rest, and could hardly believe what the glass said when I applied to it for information afterwards. The lavished garlandry of woven brown hair amazed me. I feared it was not all my own, and it required several convincing pulls to give assurance to the contrary. I then acknowledged in the coiffeur a first-rate artist, one who certainly made the most of indifferent materials. The oratory closed, the dormitory became the scene of ablutions, arrayings, and bedizenings curiously elaborate. To me it was, and ever must be, an enigma how they contrived to spend so much time in doing so little. The operation seemed close, intricate, prolonged, the result simple. A clear white muslin dress, a blue sash, the virgin's colours, a pair of white or straw-colour kid gloves, such was the gala uniform, to the assumption whereof that houseful of teachers and pupils devoted three mortal hours. But, though simple, it must be allowed the array was perfect, perfect in fashion, fit, and freshness, every head being also dressed with exquisite nicety, and a certain compact taste, suiting the full, firm comeliness of la basse-courienne contours, though too stiff for any more flowing and flexible style of beauty, the general effect was, on the whole, commendable. In beholding this diaphanous and snowy mass, I well remember feeling myself to be a mere shadowy spot on a field of light. The courage was not in me to put on a transparent white dress. Something thin I must wear, the weather and rooms being too hot to give substantial fabric sufferance, so I had sought through a dozen shops till I lit upon a crepe-like material of purple-grey, the colour, in short, of dun mist lying on a moor in bloom. My tailleurs had kindly made it as well as she could, because, as she judiciously observed, it was si triste, si pinvoyant, care in the fashion was the more imperative. It was well she took this view of the matter, for I had no flower, no jewel to relieve it, and, what was more, I had no natural rose of complexion. We became oblivious of these deficiencies in the uniform routine of daily drudgery but they will force upon us their unwelcome blank on those bright occasions when beauty should shine. However, in this same gown of shadow I felt at home and at ease, an advantage I should not have enjoyed in anything more brilliant or striking. Madame Beck, too, kept me in countenance. Her dress was almost as quiet as mine, except that she wore a bracelet and a large brooch bright with gold and fine stones. We chanced to meet on the stairs, and she gave me a nod and smile of approbation. Not that she thought I was looking well, a point unlikely to engage her interest, but she considered me dressed convenablement, décemment, and la convenance and la décence were the two calm deities of Madame's worship. She even paused, laid on my shoulder her gloved hand, holding an embroidered and perfumed handkerchief, 
and confided to my ear a sarcasm on the other teachers, whom she had just been complimenting to their faces. "'Nothing so absurd,' she said, "'as for des femmes mûres to dress themselves like girls of fifteen. Contre la Saint-Pierre, elle a l'air d'une vieille coquette qui fait l'ingénue.' Being dressed at least a couple of hours before anybody else, I felt a pleasure in betaking myself not to the garden where servants were busy propping up long tables, placing seats and spreading cloths in readiness for the collation, but to the schoolrooms, now empty, quiet, cool and clean, their walls fresh stained, their planked floors fresh scoured and scarce dry, flowers fresh gathered adorning the recesses in pots, and draperies fresh hung beautifying the great windows. Withdrawing to the first class, a smaller and neater room than the others, and taking from the glazed bookcase, of which I kept the key, a volume whose title promised some interest, I sat down to read. The glass door of this class, or schoolroom, opened into the large berceau. Acacia boughs caressed its panes, as they stretched across to meet a rose-bush blooming by the opposite lintel. In this rose-bush bees murmured, busy and happy. I commenced reading. Just as the stilly hum, the embowering shade, the warm, lonely calm of my retreat were beginning to steal meaning from the page, vision from my eyes, and to lure me along the track of reverie, down into some deep dell of dreamland, just then the sharpest ring of the street doorbell to which that much-tried instrument had ever thrilled snatched me back to consciousness. Now the bell had been ringing all the morning, as workmen or servants or coiffeurs or tailleurs went and came on their several errands. Moreover, there was good reason to expect it would ring all the afternoon, since about one hundred externes were yet to arrive in carriages or fiacres. Nor could it be expected to rest during the evening, when parents and friends would gather thronging to the play. Under these circumstances, a ring, even a sharp ring, was a matter of course. Yet this particular peal had an accent of its own, which chased my dream and startled my book from my knee. I was stooping to pick up this last when, firm, fast, straight, right on through vestibule, along corridor, across carré, through first division, second division, grand salle, strode a step, quick, regular, intent. The closed door of the first class, my sanctuary, offered no obstacle. It burst open, and a palto and bonnet crack filled the void, also two eyes first vaguely struck upon and then hungrily dived into me. Je la connais, c'est l'anglaise. Tant pis. Tout anglaise et par conséquent tout bégueuille qu'elle soit, elle fera mon affaire ou je saurai pourquoi. Then, with a certain stern politeness, I suppose he thought I had not caught the drift of his previous uncivil mutterings, and in a jargon the most execrable that ever was heard, Miss, play you must, I am planted there. "'What can I do for you, Monsieur Paul Emmanuel?' I inquired. For Monsieur Paul Emmanuel it was, and in a state of no little excitement. "'Play, you must! I will not have you shrink or frown or make the prude. I read your skull that night you came. I see your moyen. Play, you can. Play, you must.' "'But how, Monsieur Paul? What do you mean?' "'There is no time to be lost,' he went on, now speaking in French. And let us thrust to the wall all reluctance, all excuse, all minauderie. You must take a part. In the vaudeville? In the vaudeville, you have said it. I gasped, horror-struck. What did the little man mean? Listen, he said. The case shall be stated, and you shall then answer me yes or no, and according to your answer shall I ever after estimate you. The scarce suppressed impetus of a most irritable nature glowed in his cheek, fed with sharp shafts his glances, a nature, the injudicious, the mawkish, the hesitating, the sullen, the affected, above all the unyielding, might quickly render violent and implacable. Silence and attention was the best balm to apply. I listened. "'The whole matter is going to fail,' he began. Louise van der Kelkov has fallen ill, at least so her ridiculous mother asserts. For my part, I feel sure she might play it if she would. It is only goodwill that lacks. She was charged with a role, uh, as you know, or do not know, it is equal. Without that role, the play is stopped. 
There are now but a few hours in which to learn it. Not a girl in this school would hear reason and accept the task. Forsooth, it is not an interesting, not an amiable part. The vile amour propre, that base quality of which women have so much, would revolt from it. English women are either the best or the worst of their sex. Je le déteste comme la peste ordinairement, this between his recreant teeth. I applied to an English woman to rescue me. What is her answer, yes or no? A thousand objections rushed into my mind. The foreign language, the limited time, the public display. Inclination recoiled, ability faltered. Self-respect, that vile quality, trembled. No, 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 said all these. But looking up at Monsieur Paul and seeing in his vexed, fiery and searching eye a sort of appeal behind all its menace, my lips dropped the word, oui. For a moment his rigid countenance relaxed with a quiver of content. Quickly bent up again, however, he went on. Vite à l'ouvrage! Here is the book! Here is your rôle! Read! And I read. He did not commend. At some passages he scowled and stamped. He gave me a lesson. I diligently imitated. It was a disagreeable part. A man's, an empty-headed fop's. One could put into it neither heart nor soul. I hated it. The play, a mere trifle, ran chiefly on the efforts of a brace of rivals to gain the hand of a fair coquette. One lover was called the Our, a good and gallant but unpolished man, a sort of diamond in the rough. The other was a butterfly, a talker and a traitor, and I was to be the butterfly, talker and traitor. I did my best, which was bad, I know. It provoked Monsieur Paul. He fumed. Putting both hands to the work, I endeavoured to do better than my best. I presume he gave me credit for good intentions. He professed to be partially content. Saira, he cried, and as voices began sounding from the garden and white dresses fluttering among the trees, he added, You must withdraw. You must be alone to learn this. Come with me. Without being allowed time or power to deliberate, I found myself in the same breath, convoyed along as in a species of whirlwind. Upstairs, up two pairs of stairs, nay, actually up three, for this fiery little man seemed as by instinct to know his way everywhere. To the solitary and lofty attic was I born, put in and locked in, the key being in the door, and that key he took with him, and vanished. The attic was no pleasant place. I believe he did not know how unpleasant it was, or he never would have locked me in with so little ceremony. In this summer weather it was as hot as Africa, as in winter it was always cold as Greenland. Boxes and lumber filled it, old dresses draped its unstained wall cobwebs its unswept ceiling. Well was it known to be tenanted by rats, by black beetles, and by cockroaches. Nay, rumour affirmed that the ghostly nun of the garden had once been seen here. A partial darkness obscured one end, across which, as for deeper mystery, an old russet curtain was drawn, by way of screen to a sombre band of winter cloaks, pendant each from its pin like a malefactor from his gibbet. From amongst these cloaks, and behind that curtain, the nun was said to issue— I did not believe this, nor was I troubled by apprehension thereof. But I saw a very dark and large rat with a long tail come gliding out from that squalid alcove. And, moreover, my eye fell on many a black beetle dotting the floor. These objects discomposed me more, perhaps, than it would be wise to say, as also did the dust, lumber, and stifling heat of the place. The last inconvenience would soon have become intolerable had I not found means to open and prop up the skylight, thus admitting some freshness. Underneath this aperture I pushed a large empty chest, and, having mounted upon it a smaller box, and wiped from both the dust, I gathered my dress, my best, the reader must remember, and therefore a legitimate object of care, fastidiously around me, ascended this species of extempore throne, and, being seated, commenced the acquisition of my task, while I learned, not forgetting, to keep a sharp lookout on the black beetles and cockroaches, of which, more even, I believe, than of the rats, I sat in mortal dread. My impression at first was that I had undertaken what it really was impossible to perform, and I simply resolved to do my best and be resigned to fail. I soon found, however, that one part in so short a piece was not more than memory could master at a few hours' notice. I learned and learned on, first in a whisper and then aloud. Perfectly secure from human audience, I acted my part before the garret vermin. 
entering into its emptiness, frivolity and falsehood with a spirit inspired by scorn and impatience, I took my revenge on this fat by making him as fatuitous as I possibly could. In this exercise the afternoon passed. Day began to glide into evening, and I, who had eaten nothing since breakfast, grew excessively hungry. Now I thought of the collation, which doubtless they were just then devouring in the garden far below. I had seen in the vestibule a basket full of small pâté à la crème, than which nothing in the whole range of cookery seemed to me better. A pâté, or square of cake, it seemed to me would come very à propos, and as my relish for those dainties increased, it began to appear somewhat hard that I should pass my holiday fasting and in prison. Remote as was the attic from the street door and vestibule, yet the ever-tinkling bell was faintly audible here, and also the ceaseless roll of wheels on the tormented pavement. I knew that the house and garden were thronged, and that all was gay and glad below. Here it began to grow dusk. The beetles were fading from my sight. I trembled lest they should steal on me a march, mount my throne unseen, and unsuspected invade my skirts. Impatient and apprehensive, I recommenced the rehearsal of my part, merely to kill time. Just as I was concluding, the long-delayed rattle of the key in the lock came to my ear. No unwelcome sound. Monsieur Paul, I could just see through the dusk that it was Monsieur Paul, for light enough still lingered to show the velvet blackness of his close-shorn head, and the sallow ivory of his brow, looked in. Brava! cried he, holding the door open and remaining at the threshold. J'ai tout entendu. C'est assez bien. Encore. A moment I hesitated. Encore, said he sternly. Et point de grimace. A bas la timidité. Again I went through the part, but not half so well as I had spoken it alone. Enfin, elle sait, said he, half dissatisfied, and one cannot be fastidious or exacting under these circumstances. Then he added, You may yet have twenty minutes for préparation. Au revoir. And he was going. Monsieur, I called out, taking courage. Ah bien, qu'est-ce que c'est, mademoiselle? J'ai bien faim. Comment, vous avez faim? Et la collation? I know nothing about it. I have not seen it shut up here. Ah, c'est vrai, cried he. In a moment my throne was abdicated, the attic evacuated, an inverse repetition of the impetus which had brought me up into the attic instantly took me down. Down, down to the very kitchen. I thought I should have gone to the cellar. The cook was imperatively ordered to produce food, and I, as imperatively, was commanded to eat. To my great joy this food was limited to coffee and cake. I had feared wine and sweets, which I did not like. How he guessed that I should like a petit pâté à la crème, I cannot tell but he went out and procured me one from some quarter. With considerable willingness I ate and drank, keeping the petit pâté till the last, as a bon bouche. Monsieur Poul superintended my repast, and almost forced upon me more than I could swallow. "'A la bonne heure!' he cried, when I signified that I really could take no more, and with uplifted hands implored to be spared the additional roll on which he had just spread butter." "'You will set me down as a species of tyrant and blue-beard starving women in a garret, "'whereas, after all, I am no such thing. "'Now, mademoiselle, do you feel courage and strength to appear?' "'I said I thought I did, though in truth I was perfectly confused, "'and could hardly tell how I felt. "'But this little man was of the order of beings who must not be opposed, "'unless you possessed an all-dominant force sufficient to crush him at once.' "'Come, then,' said he, offering his hand. I gave him mine, and he set off with a rapid walk, which obliged me to run at his side in order to keep pace. In the carré he stopped a moment. It was lit with large lamps. The wide doors of the classes were open, and so were the equally wide garden doors. Orange trees in tubs and tall flowers in pots ornamented these portals on each side. Groups of ladies and gentlemen in evening dress stood and walked amongst the flowers. Within, the long vista of the schoolrooms presented a thronging, undulating, murmuring, waving, streaming multitude, all rose and blue and half-translucent white. There were lustres burning overhead. Far off there was a stage, a solemn green curtain, a row of footlights. N'est-ce pas que c'est beau? demanded my companion. I should have said it was, but my heart got up into my throat. Monsieur Paul discovered this and gave me a side scowl and a little shake for my pains. "'I will do my best, but I wish it was over,' said I. Then I asked, "'Are we to walk through that crowd?' 
"'By no means. I manage matters better. We pass through the garden. Here.' In an instant we were out of doors. The cool, calm night revived me somewhat. It was moonless, but the reflex from the many glowing windows lit the court brightly, and even the alleys dimly. Heaven was cloudless and grand with the quiver of its living fires. How soft are the nights of the continent! How bland, balmy, safe! No sea-fog, no chilling damp, mistless as noon and fresh as morning. Having crossed court and garden, we reached the glass door of the first class. It stood open like all other doors that night. We passed, and then I was ushered into a small cabinet, dividing the first class from the grand salle. This cabinet dazzled me. It was so full of light. It deafened me. It was clamorous with voices. It stifled me. It was so hot, choking, thronged. "'De l'ordre, du silence!' cried Monsieur Paul. "'Is this chaos?' he demanded. And there was a hush. With a dozen words and as many gestures, he turned out half the persons present, and obliged the remnant to fall into rank. Those left were all in costume. They were the performers, and this was the green room. Monsieur Paul introduced me. All stared, and some tittered. It was a surprise. They had not expected the Englishwoman would play in a vaudeville. Ginevra Fanshawe, beautifully dressed for her part, and looking fascinatingly pretty, turned on me a pair of eyes as round as beads. In the highest spirit, unperturbed by fear or bashfulness, delighted indeed at the thought of shining off before hundreds, my entrance seemed to transfix her with amazement in the midst of her joy. She would have exclaimed, but Monsieur Paul held her and all the rest in check. Having surveyed and criticised the whole troop, he turned to me. "'You too must be dressed for your part.' "'Dressed! Dressed like a man!' exclaimed Zélie St. Pierre, darting forwards, adding with officiousness, "'I will dress her myself.' To be dressed like a man did not please, and would not suit me. I had consented to take a man's name and part. As to his dress, haute la no, I would keep my own dress come what might. Monsieur Paul might storm, might rage. I would keep my own dress. I said so, with a voice as resolute in intent as it was low, and perhaps unsteady in utterance. He did not immediately storm or rage, as I fully thought he would. He stood silent. But Zélie again interposed. She will make a capital petit maître. Here are the garments, all, all complete, somewhat too large, but I will arrange all that. Come, cher ami, belle anglaise. And she sneered, for I was not belle. She seized my hand. She was drawing me away. Monsieur Paul stood impassable, neutral. You must not resist, pursued St. Pierre, for resist I did. You will spoil all, destroy the mirth of the peace, the enjoyment of the company, sacrifice everything to your amour propre. This would be too bad. Monsieur will never permit this. She sought his eye. I watched likewise for a glance. He gave her one, and then he gave me one. Stop, he said slowly, arresting St. Pierre, who continued her efforts to drag me after her. Everybody awaited the decision. He was not angry, not irritated. I perceived that and took heart. "'You do not like these clothes?' he asked, pointing to the masculine vestments. "'I don't object to some of them, but I won't have them all.' "'How must it be, then? How accept a man's part and go on the stage dressed as a woman? This is an amateur affair, it is true, a vaudeville de pensionnat. Certain modifications I might sanction, yet something you must have to announce you as of the nobler sex. And I will, monsieur, but it must be arranged in my own way. Nobody must meddle. The things must not be forced upon me. Just let me dress myself. Monsieur, without another word, took the costume from St. Pierre, gave it to me, and permitted me to pass into the dressing room. Once alone I grew calm, and collectedly went to work. Retaining my woman's garb without the slightest retrenchment, I merely assumed, in addition, a little vest, a collar and cravat, and a paletot of small dimensions, the whole being the costume of a brother of one of the pupils. Having loosened my hair out of its braids, made up the long back hair close, and 
brushed the front hair to one side. I took my hat and gloves in my hand and came out. Monsieur Paul was waiting, and so were the others. He looked at me. "'That may pass in a pensionnat,' he pronounced, then added, not unkindly, "'Courage, mon ami, un peu de sang-froid, un peu d'aplomb. Monsieur Lucien et tout ira bien.' St. Pierre sneered again in her cold, snaky manner. I was irritable because excited, and I could not help turning upon her and saying that, if she were not a lady and I a gentleman, I should feel disposed to call her out. "'After the play, after the play,' said Monsieur Paul, "'I will then divide my pair of pistols between you, and we will settle the dispute according to form. It will only be the old quarrel of France and England.' but now the moment approached for the performance to commence. Monsieur Paul, setting us before him, harangued us briefly like a general addressing soldiers about to charge. I don't know what he said, except that he recommended each to penetrate herself with a sense of her personal insignificance. I thought this advice superfluous for some of us. A bell tinkled. I and two more were ushered on to the stage. The bell tinkled again. I had to speak the very first words. "'Do not look at the crowd, nor think of it,' whispered Monsieur Paul in my ear. "'Imagine yourself in the garret, acting to the rats.' He vanished. The curtain drew up, shriveled to the ceiling. The bright lights, the long room, the gay throng burst upon us. I thought of the black beetles, the old boxes, the worm-eaten bureau. I said my say badly, but I said it. That first speech was the difficulty— it revealed to me this fact, that it was not the crowd I feared so much as my own voice. Foreigners and strangers, the crowd were nothing to me, nor did I think of them. When my tongue once got free and my voice took its true pitch and found its natural tone, I thought of nothing but the personage I represented, and of Monsieur Paul, who was listening, watching, prompting in the side scenes. By and by, feeling the right power come, the spring demanded gush and rise inwardly, I became sufficiently composed to notice my fellow actors. Some of them played very well, especially Ginevra Fanshawe, who had to coquette between two suitors and managed admirably. In fact, she was in her element. I observed that she once or twice threw a certain marked fondness and pointed partiality into her manner towards me, the fop. With such emphasis and animation did she favour me, such glances did she dart out into the listening and applauding crowd, that to me, who knew her, it presently became evident she was acting at someone. And I followed her eye, her smile, her gesture, and ere long discovered that she had at least singled out a handsome and distinguished aim for her shafts, full in the path of those arrows, taller than other spectators, and therefore more sure to receive them, stood in attitude quiet but intent, a well-known form, that of Dr. John. The spectacle seemed somehow suggestive. There was language in Dr. John's look, though I cannot tell what he said. It animated me. I drew out of it a history. I put my idea into the part I performed. I threw it into my wooing of Ginevra. In the Our, or sincere lover, I saw Dr. John. Did I pity him, as erst? No, I hardened my heart, rivalled and outrivalled him. I knew myself but a fop, but where he was outcast, I could please. Now I know I acted as if wishful and resolute to win and conquer. Ginevra seconded me. Between us we half changed the nature of the role, gilding it from top to toe. Between the acts, Monsieur Paul told us he knew not what possessed us, and half expostulated— C'est peut-être plus beau que votre modèle, said he, mais ce n'est pas juste. I know not what possessed me either, but somehow my longing was to eclipse the our, i.e., Dr. John. Ginevra was tender. How could I be otherwise than chivalric? Retaining the letter, I recklessly altered the spirit of the role. Without heart, without interest, I could not play it at all. It must be played, in went the yearned-for seasoning, thus favoured, I played it with relish. What I felt that night, and what I did, I no more expected to feel and do than to be lifted in a trance to the seventh heaven. Cold, reluctant, apprehensive, I had accepted a part to please another. 
Ere long, warming, becoming interested, taking courage, I acted to please myself. Yet the next day, when I thought it over, I quite disapproved of these amateur performances. And though glad that I had obliged Monsieur Paul, and tried my own strength for once, I took a firm resolution never to be drawn into a similar affair. A keen relish for dramatic expression had revealed itself as part of my nature. To cherish and exercise this new-found faculty might gift me with a world of delight, but it would not do for a mere looker-on at life. The strength and longing must be put by, and I put them by, and fastened them in with the lock of a resolution which neither time nor temptation has since picked. No sooner was the play over, and well over, than the choleric and arbitrary Monsieur Paul underwent a metamorphosis. His hour of managerial responsibility passed, he at once laid aside his magisterial austerity. In a moment he stood amongst us, vivacious, kind, and social, shook hands with us all round, thanked us separately, and announced his determination that each of us should in turn be his partner in the coming ball. On his claiming my promise, I told him I did not dance. "'For once I must,' was the answer, and if I had not slipped aside and kept out of his way, he would have compelled me to this second performance. But I had acted enough for one evening. It was time I retired into myself and my ordinary life. My dun-coloured dress did well enough under a paletot on the stage, but would not suit a waltz or quadrille. Withdrawing to a quiet nook, whence unobserved I could observe— the ball, its splendours and its pleasures, passed before me as a spectacle. Again Ginevra Fanshawe was the belle, the fairest and the gayest present. She was selected to open the ball. Very lovely she looked, very gracefully she danced, very joyously she smiled. Such scenes were her triumphs. She was the child of pleasure. Work or suffering found her listless and dejected, powerless and repining. But gaiety expanded her butterfly's wings— lit up their gold dust and bright spots, made her flash like a gem and flush like a flower. At all ordinary diet and plain beverage she would pout, but she fed on creams and ices like a hummingbird on honey-paste. Sweet wine was her element, and sweet cake her daily bread. She never lived her full life in a ballroom, elsewhere she drooped dispirited. Think not, reader, that she thus bloomed and sparkled for the mere sake of Monsieur Paul, her partner, or that she lavished her best graces that night for the edification of her companions only, or for that of the parents and grandparents who filled the carré and lined the ballroom. Under circumstances so insipid and limited, with motives so chilly and vapid, Ginevra would scarce have deigned to walk one quadrille, and weariness and fretfulness would have replaced animation and good humour but she knew of eleven in the otherwise heavy festal mass which lighted the whole. She tasted a condiment which gave it zest. She perceived reasons justifying the display of her choicest attractions. In the ballroom, indeed, not a single male spectator was to be seen who was not married and a father, Monsieur Paul accepted. That gentleman, too, being the sole creature of his sex, permitted to lead out a pupil to the dance— and this exceptional part was allowed him partly as a matter of old established custom, for he was a kinsman of Madame Beck's and high in her confidence, partly because he would always have his own way and do as he pleased, and partly because, wilful, passionate, partial as he might be, he was the soul of honour, and might be trusted with a regiment of the fairest and purest, in perfect security that, under his leadership, they would come to no harm. Many of the girls, it may be noted in parenthesis, were not pure-minded at all, very much otherwise, but they no more dare betray their natural coarseness in Monsieur Paul's presence than they dare to tread purposely on his corns, laugh in his face during a stormy apostrophe, or speak above their breath while some crisis of irritability was covering his human visage with the mask of an intelligent tiger. Monsieur Paul, then, might dance with whom he would— and woe be to the interference which put him out of step. Others there were admitted as spectators, with seeming reluctance, through prayers by influence under restriction, by special and difficult exercise of Madame Beck's gracious good nature, and whom she all the evening, with her own personal surveillance, kept far aloof at the remotest, drearest, coldest, darkest side of the carré, a small forlorn band of jeunes gens, 
these being all of the best families, grown-up sons of mothers present, and whose sisters were pupils in the school. That whole evening was Madame on duty beside these jeunes gens, attentive to them as a mother, but strict with them as a dragon. There was a sort of cordon stretched before them, which they wearied her with prayers to be permitted to pass, and just to revive themselves by one dance with that belle blonde, or that jolie brune, or cette jeune fille a magnifique aux cheveux noirs comme le jet. Tessez-vous, madame would reply, heroically and inexorably. Vous ne passerez pas à moi ce que ne soit sur mon cadavre, et vous ne danserez qu'avec la nonnette du jardin, alluding to the legend and she majestically walked to and fro along their disconsolate and impatient line, like a little Bonaparte in a mouse-coloured silk gown. Madame knew something of the world. Madame knew much of human nature. I don't think that another directress in Villette would have dared to admit a jeune homme within her walls, but Madame knew that by granting such admission, on occasion like the present, a bold stroke might be struck, and a great point gained. In the first place the parents were made accomplices to the deed, for it was only through their mediation it was brought about. Secondly, the admission of these rattlesnakes, so fascinating and so dangerous, served to draw out Madame precisely in her strongest character, that of a first-rate surveillant. Thirdly, their presence furnished a most piquant ingredient to the entertainment. The pupils knew it and saw it and the view of such golden apples shining afar off animated them with a spirit no other circumstance could have kindled. The children's pleasure spread to the parents. Life and mirth circulated quickly round the ballroom. The jeunes gens themselves, though restrained, were amused, for Madame never permitted them to feel dull, and thus Madame Beck's fate annually ensured a success unknown to the fate of any other directress in the land. I observed that Dr. John was at first permitted to walk at large through the classes. There was about him a manly, responsible look that redeemed his youth, and half expiated his beauty. But as soon as the ball began, Madame ran up to him. "'Come, Wolf, come,' said she, laughing. "'You wear sheep's clothing, but you must quit the fold notwithstanding. Come, I have a fine menagerie of twenty here in the carré. Let me place you amongst my collection.' but first suffer me to have one dance with one pupil of my choice. "'Have you the face to ask such a thing? It is madness. It is impiety. Sautez, sautez, au plus vite!' She drove him before her, and soon had him enclosed within the cordon. Ginevra, being, I suppose, tired with dancing, sought me out in my retreat. She threw herself on the bench beside me, and, a demonstration I could very well have dispensed with, cast her arms round my neck. "'Lucy Snow! Lucy Snow!' she cried, in a somewhat sobbing voice, half hysterical. "'What in the world is the matter?' I dryly said. "'How do I look? How do I look to-night?' she demanded. "'As usual,' said I, preposterously vain. "'Caustic creature! You never have a kind word for me. But in spite of you and all other envious detractors, I know I am beautiful. I feel it, I see it for there is a great looking-glass in the dressing-room, where I can view my shape from head to foot. Will you go with me now, and let us two stand before it? I will, Miss Fanshawe. You shall be humoured even to the top of your bent. The dressing-room was very near, and we stepped in. Putting her arm through mine, she drew me to the mirror. Without resistance, remonstrance, or remark, I stood and let her self-love have its feast and triumph. Curious to see how much it could swallow— whether it was possible it could feed to satiety, whether any whisper of consideration for others could penetrate her heart and moderate its vainglorious exultation. Not at all. She turned me and herself round. She viewed us both on all sides. She smiled. She waved her curls. She retouched her sash. She spread her dress. And finally, letting go my arm, and curtsying with mock respect, she said, "'I would not be you for a kingdom.' The mark was too naive to arouse anger. I merely said, "'Very good.' "'And what would you give to be me?' she inquired. "'Not a bad sixpence, strange as it may sound,' I replied. "'You are but a poor creature.' "'You don't think so in your heart?' "'No, for in my heart you have not the outline of a place. I only occasionally turn you over in my brain.' "'Well, but,' said she in an expostulatory tone, 
Just listen to the difference of our positions, and then see how happy am I, and how miserable are you. Go on, I listen. In the first place, I am the daughter of a gentleman of family, and though my father is not rich, I have expectations from an uncle. Then I am just eighteen, the finest age possible. I have had a continental education, and though I can't spell, I have abundant accomplishments. I am pretty. You can't deny that. I may have as many admirers as I choose. This very night I have been breaking the hearts of two gentlemen, and it is the dying look I had from one of them just now which puts me in such spirits. I do so like to watch them turn red and pale, and scowl and dart fiery glances at each other, and languishing ones at me. There is me, happy me. Now for you, poor soul. I suppose you are nobody's daughter since you took care of little children when you first came to Villette. You have no relations. You can't call yourself young at twenty-three. You have no attractive accomplishments, no beauty. As to admirers, you hardly know what they are. You can't even talk on the subject. You sit dumb when the other teachers quote their conquests. I believe you never were in love, and never will be. You don't know the feeling, and so much the better. For though you might have your own heart broken, no living heart will you ever break. Isn't it all true? A good deal of it is as true as gospel, and shrewd besides. There must be good in you, Ginevra, to speak so honestly. That snake, Zélie St. Pierre, could not utter what you have uttered. Still, Miss Fanshawe, hapless as I am, according to your showing, sixpence I would not give to purchase you, body and soul. Just because I am not clever, and that is all you think of. Nobody in the world but you cares for cleverness. On the contrary, I consider you are clever in your way, very smart indeed. But you were talking of breaking hearts, that edifying amusement into the merits of which I don't quite enter. Pray on whom does your vanity lead you to think you have done execution to-night? She approached her lips to my ear. Isidore and Alfred de Hamal are both here, she whispered. Oh, are they? I should like to see them. There's a dear creature. Your curiosity is roused at last. Follow me. I will point them out. She proudly led the way. But you cannot see them well from the classes, said she, turning. Madame keeps them too far off. Let us cross the garden, enter by the corridor, and get close to them behind. We shall be scolded if we are seen, but never mind. For once I did not mind. Through the gardens we went, penetrated into the corridor by a quiet private entrance, and approaching the carré, yet keeping in the corridor shade, commanded a near view of the band of jeunes gens. I believe I could have picked out the conquering de Hamal even undirected. He was a straight-nosed, very correct-featured little dandy. I say little dandy, though he was not beneath the middle standards in stature. But his lineaments were small, and so were his hands and feet. And he was pretty and smooth and as trim as a doll. So nicely dressed, so nicely curled, so booted and gloved and cravatted. He was charming indeed. I said so. "'What a dear personage!' cried I, and commended Ginevra's taste warmly, and asked her what she thought de Hamal might have done with the precious fragments of that heart she had broken, whether he kept them in a scent vial and conserved them in otto of roses. I observed, too, with deep rapture of approbation that the Colonel's hands were scarce larger than Miss Fanshawe's own, and suggested that this circumstance might be convenient, as he could wear her gloves at a pinch. On his dear curls I told her I doted, as to his low Grecian brow and exquisite classic headpiece, I confessed I had no language to do such perfections justice. And if he were your lover? suggested the cruelly exultant Ginevra. Oh, heavens, what bliss! said I. But do not be inhuman, Miss Fanshawe. To put such thoughts into my head is like showing poor outcast Cain a far glimpse of paradise. You like him, then? as I like sweets and jams and comfits and conservatory flowers. She never admired my taste, for all these things were her adoration. She could then readily credit that they were mine, too. Now for Isidore, I went on. I own I felt still more curious to see him than his rival, but Ginevra was absorbed in the latter. Alfred was admitted here to-night, said she, through the influence of his aunt, Madame la Baronne de Dolodo. And now, having seen him, can you not understand why I have been in such spirits all the evening, and acted so well, and danced with such life, and why I am now happy as a queen? 
It was such good fun to glance first at him and then at the other, and madden them both. But that other, where is he? Show me Isidore. I don't like. Why not? I am ashamed of him. For what reason? Because he has such, such whiskers. Orange. Red. There now. The murder is out, I subjoined. Never mind. Show him all the same. I engage not to faint. She looked round. Just then an English voice spoke behind her and me. You are both standing in a draught. You must leave this corridor. There is no draught, Dr. John, said I, turning. She takes cold so easily, he pursued, looking at Ginevra with extreme kindness. She is delicate. She must be cared for. Fetch her a shawl. Permit me to judge for myself, said Miss Fanshawe with hauteur. I want no shawl. Your dress is thin. You have been dancing. You are overheated. Always preaching, retorted she. Always coddling and admonishing. The answer Dr. John would have given did not come. That his heart was hurt became evident in his eye. Darkened and saddened and pained, he turned a little aside but was patient. I knew where there were plenty of shawls near at hand. I ran and fetched one. She shall wear this if I have strength to make her, said I, folding it well round her muslin dress, covering carefully her neck and her arms. Is that Isidore? I asked in a somewhat fierce whisper. She pushed up her lip, smiled and nodded. Is that Isidore? I repeated, giving her a shake. I could have given her another. C'est lui même, said she. How coarse he is compared with the Colonel Count. And then, oh, ciel, the whiskers. Dr. John now passed on. The Colonel Count, I echoed. The doll, the puppet, the mannequin, the poor inferior creature. A mere lackey for Dr. John, his valet, his footboy. Is it possible that fine, generous gentleman, handsome as a vision, offers you his honourable hand and gallant heart, and promises to protect your flimsy person and feckless mind through the storms and struggles of life? And you hang back. You scorn, you sting, you torture him. Have you power to do this? Who gave you that power? Where is it? Does it lie all in your beauty, your pink and white complexion and your yellow hair? Does this bind his soul at your feet and bend his neck under your yoke? Does this purchase for you his affection, his tenderness, his thoughts, his hopes, his interest, his noble, cordial love? And will you not have it? Do you scorn it? You are only dissembling. You are not in earnest. You love him. You long for him. But you trifle with his heart to make him more surely yours? But how you run on! I don't understand half you have said. I had got her out into the garden ere this. I now set her down on a seat and told her she should not stir till she had avowed which she meant in the end to accept. The man or the monkey? Him you call the man, said she, is bourgeois, sandy-haired, and answers to the name of John. Cela suffit. Je n'en veux pas. Colonel de Hamal is a gentleman of excellent connections, perfect manners, sweet appearance, with pale, interesting face, and hair and eyes like an Italian. Then, too, he is the most delightful company possible, a man quite in my way, not sensible and serious like the other, but one with whom I can talk on equal terms, who does not plague and bore and harass me with depths and heights and passions and talents for which I have no taste. There, now, don't hold me so fast. I slackened my grasp, and she darted off. I did not care to pursue her. Somehow I could not avoid returning once more in the direction of the corridor to get another glimpse of Dr. John. But I met him on the garden steps, standing where the light from a window fell broad. His well-proportioned figure was not to be mistaken, for I doubt whether there was another in that assemblage his equal. He carried his hat in his hand. His uncovered head, his face, and fine brow were most handsome and manly. His features were not delicate, not slight like those of a woman— nor were they cold, frivolous, and feeble. Though well cut, they were not so chiselled, so frittered away, as to lose in expression or significance what they gained in unmeaning symmetry. Much feeling spoke in them at times, and more sat silent in his eye. Such at least were my thoughts of him. To me he seemed all this. An inexpressible sense of wonder occupied me as I looked at this man, 
and reflected that he could not be slighted. It was not my intention to approach or address him in the garden, our terms of acquaintance not warranting such a step. I had only meant to view him in the crowd, myself unseen. Coming upon him thus alone, I withdrew. But he was looking out for me, or rather for her who had been with me. Therefore he descended the steps and followed me down the alley. "'You know Miss Fanshawe. I have often wished to ask whether you knew her,' said he. "'Yes, I know her. Intimately? Quite as intimately as I wish. What have you done with her now? Am I her keeper?' I felt inclined to ask, but I simply answered. "'I have shaken her well, and would have shaken her better, but she escaped out of my hands and ran away.' "'Would you favour me?' he asked, "'by watching over her this one evening, "'and observing that she does nothing imprudent, "'does not, for instance, run out into the night air "'immediately after dancing? "'I may, perhaps, look after her a little, since you wish it, "'but she likes her own way too well to submit readily to control.' "'She is so young, so thoroughly artless,' said he. "'To me she is an enigma,' I responded. "'Is she?' he asked, much interested. How? It would be difficult to say how, difficult at least to tell you how. And why me? I wonder she is not better pleased that you are so much her friend. But she has not the slightest idea how much I am her friend. That is precisely the point I cannot teach her. May I inquire, did she ever speak of me to you? Under the name of Isidore she has talked about you often. "'but I must add that it is only within the last ten minutes "'I have discovered that you and Isidore are identical. "'It is only, Dr. John, within that brief space of time "'I have learned that Ginevra Fanshawe is the person, under this roof, "'in whom you have long been interested, "'that she is the magnet which attracts you to the roof or set, "'that for her sake you venture into this garden "'and seek out caskets dropped by rivals. "'You know all. "'I know so much.' For more than a year I have been accustomed to meet her in society. Mrs. Colmondeley, her friend, is an acquaintance of mine. Thus I see her every Sunday. But you observe that under the name of Isidore she often spoke of me. May I, uh, without inviting you to a breach of confidence, inquire what was the tone, what the feeling of her remarks? I feel somewhat anxious to know, being a little tormented with uncertainty as to how I stand with her. Oh, she varies. She shifts and changes like the wind. "'Still, you can gather some general idea?' "'I can,' thought I, "'but it would not do to communicate that general idea to you. "'Besides, if I said she did not love you, "'I know you would not believe me.' "'You are silent,' he pursued. "'I suppose you have no good news to impart. "'No matter. "'If she feels for me positive coldness and aversion, "'it is a sign I do not deserve her. "'Do you doubt yourself?' Do you consider yourself the inferior of Colonel de Hamal? I love Miss Fanshawe far more than de Hamal loves any human being, and would care for and guard her better than he. Respecting de Hamal, I fear she is under an illusion. The man's character is known to me, all his antecedents, all his scrapes. He is not worthy of your beautiful young friend. My beautiful young friend ought to know that, and to know or feel who is worthy of her, said I. If her beauty or her brains will not serve her so far, she merits the sharp lesson of experience. Are you not a little severe? I am excessively severe, more severe than I choose to show you. You should hear the strictures with which I favour my beautiful young friend, only that you would be unutterably shocked at my want of tender considerateness for her delicate nature. She is so lovely, one cannot but be loving towards her. You... Every woman older than herself must feel for such a simple, innocent, girlish fairy a sort of motherly or elder-sisterly fondness. Graceful angel! Does not your heart yearn towards her when she pours into your ear her pure childlike confidences? How you are privileged! And he sighed. I cut short these confidences somewhat abruptly now and then, said I. But excuse me, Dr. John, may I change the theme for one instant? What a godlike person is that de Hamal! What a nose on his face! Perfect! Model one in putty or clay you could not make a better or straighter or neater. And then such classic lips and chin, and his bearing, sublime. De Hamal is an unutterable puppy, 
besides being a very white-livered hero. You, Dr. John, and every man of less refined mould than he must feel for him a sort of admiring affection, such as Mars and the coarser deities may be supposed to have borne the young graceful Apollo. An unprincipled gambling little jackanapes, said Dr. John curtly, whom with one hand I could lift up by the waistband any day and lay low in the kennel if I liked. The sweet seraph, said I, what a cruel idea. Are you not a little severe, Dr. John? And now I paused. For the second time that night I was going beyond myself, venturing out of what I looked on as my natural habits, speaking in an unpremeditated, impulsive strain, which startled me strangely when I halted to reflect. On rising that morning, had I anticipated that before night I should have acted the part of a gay lover in a vaudeville, and an hour later frankly discussed with Dr. John the question of his hapless suit, and rallied him on his illusions. I had no more presaged such feats than I had looked forward to an ascent in a balloon, or a voyage to Cape Horn. The doctor and I, having paced down the walk, were now returning. The reflex from the window again lit his face. He smiled, but his eye was melancholy. How I wished that he could feel his heart's ease! How I grieved that he brooded over pain, and pain from such a cause! He with his great advantages! He to love in vain! I did not then know that the pensiveness of reverse is the best phase for some minds, nor did I reflect that some herbs, though scentless when entire, yield fragrance when they are bruised. "'Do not be sorrowful, do not grieve,' I broke out. "'If there is in Ginevra one spark of worthiness of your affection, she will, she must feel devotion in return. Be cheerful, be hopeful, Dr. John. Who should hope if not you?' In return for this speech I got what it must be supposed I deserved, a look of surprise. I thought also of some disapprobation. We parted and I went into the house very chill. The clock struck and the bells tolled midnight. People were leaving fast. The fate was over. The lamps were fading. In another hour all the dwelling-house and all the pensionat were dark and hushed. I too was in bed, but not asleep. To me it was not easy to sleep after a day of such excitement. End of chapter 14